Welcome everybody from me. Um, thanks for turning up so early in the morning. Um, today we have the honor of having an early uh, career researcher as a speaker who um, in a short time already has uh, had tremendous achievements. Anne-Maria Roque recently graduated with a PhD in um, uh, uh, marketing from UTS. Um, she has published in the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science, which is a um, Financial Times uh, 50 journal, right? Very competitive, um, very well done, Anne-Marie. And she's now also employed as a lecturer um, at UQ uh, uh, recently. So um, I thought I'd invite her because she's um, able to share um, uh, really valuable um, experiences about how to make it in academia. So um, uh, thanks, Anne-Marie, and I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Frank, and thanks everyone uh, for joining. So I'll get started. So I thought I would uh, start with a little bit about uh, myself, which the structure of the presentation, I'll first um, quickly introduce myself and my research interests and then take you through uh, the JAMS research that Frank mentioned. And then at the end, I will share my reflections on my very long and windy road to landing a lecturer job at UQ this year. So I started that role in January uh, this year, so it is um, quite new. And I guess, um, you know, telling you a bit about myself yeah, will give you an understanding of why it was a longer road than um, perhaps your average. So. Uh, Education-wise, um, I did a Bachelor of Commerce um, at UNSW. I then entered the workforce uh, for about eight years before I decided to do an MBA at the University, um, at Macquarie University. Also then went back to the workforce and then embarked on my PhD at UTS. So that um, I my PhD was conferred in 2018. And as you can see from the institutions there, I am uh, originally from Sydney. So like I said, I, you know, between my undergrad and master's and then between the master's and the PhD, and even after the PhD, I went back to industry. So I've got quite a bit of industry experience. And in terms of, you know, where I've worked, I've got, you know, some of the um, organisations listed there. So I've worked both in commercial organisations, so Telstra, Foxtel, Kimberly Clark, Yahoo. I've worked in government. So I did a stint at the Department of Transport and Main Roads in market research. And I've also done brand consulting. So I spent a bit of time doing freelance brand consulting and during that stint, I worked for brands like Q Super and Ramsey Health. So I've had your typical, um, you know, marketing manager role. I've been in market research. I've been a consultant. So I kind of feel like I have, you know, touched all domains of what you can do in industry um, research, or industry experience, sorry. And then Teaching-wise, I've also uh, taught across various institutions, and that's because I did spend quite a few years as a, a sessional academic. And I'm sure, oh, I know some of you online are se sessional academics, so you know you kind of, you know, move around um, when you're in that role. So, yeah, so I'm not your typical academic that has done, you know, your bachelor your honours straight into a PhD and into an academic role. I have had um, a windier road to, to academia. So in terms of research, my core area is branding. And I'd say I emphasise that because when we go back to my tips, I um, will talk about having a specialisation. So for me, that's branding. And you know, you can kind of stretch that to branding and loyalty. So I look at areas to do with brand strategy. So brand differentiation, um, looking at brand purpose at the moment, uh, brand consistency. So different uh, domains, but all under the umbrella of brand strategy. 
I also look at loyalty program effectiveness. So, you know, how can you design your loyalty program to drive uh, brand loyalty, both behaviorally and attitudinally? And that's the paper I'll dive into today. Uh, I, then a sub area that I do research in is in the field of endorsements. So you can see, you know, that there is an overlap with branding because specifically I look at types of brand fit. Uh, so whether the endorser fits with the brand. Uh, so I've got a publication in that, which I'll briefly mention, and I'm working on a meta-analysis in the area of brand fit uh, at the moment. And then the last area is uh, stereotyping in, in the marketplace. So, you know, this can overlap with both uh, branding and endorsements. So I look at the effects of stereotypes on marketing outcomes and the impacts of negative uh, stereotypes. In terms of method, I mainly do experimental work and meta-analysis, but I do, um, I have touched on survey research uh, as well. Okay, so here are my um, publications or the successes I've had in, in with publications uh, so far. So I've got two uh, publications in the Journal of Marketing Management. So the first one there on the left uh, looked at, so this is in the area of endorsement, and it looked at when a controversial celebrity can actually be positive for a brand. The middle one is um, the, the, the research that I will talk about today, so the meta-analysis uh, in loyalty programs. The other, JMM, looks at, you know, does brand differentiation, which is a really old concept, does it actually drive purchase? So, you know, in what circumstances or context is brand differentiation more important? And um, another publication from this year, one with uh, Frank, it looked at when direct and indirect experience actually affects the racial bias that we know exists with, with tipping. Um, and this is, you know, a big topic in the US where, you know, tips um, are a big part of service, personnel's financial being, part of it's part of their wage and salary. So we know that, um, you know, racial bias, uh, racial stereotyping exists. So we wanted to look at the effect of uh, direct and indirect experience, such as the time you have with that service personnel. And so I've got the dotted line there because I wanted to show you um, the pubs that I had before I got the role at UQ. So when I went in for, my, when I applied and when I, when I went in for my interview at UQ, I had the three publications, um, the, the Journal of Consumer Marketing one came later. All right, so that is a brief intro on um, myself, but I'll kind of come back to it when I, um, you know, reflect on what got me the job at EQ and any tips uh, I can offer you. So for now, I'll spend some time talking about uh, the JAMS publication. So as you can see below, I'm one of uh, six authors on this publication. So I worked with uh, Alex Belly from the University of Adelaide, Francois Carolat from HEC Montreal, but he's um, he's moving to Griffith at the at the end of this year, next month. Uh, Lubomir Popovac from UNSW, Valentina Milnik from also from UNSW, and Nakaterina who um, has moved to industry. So something you might think is like, well, there's a lot of uh, authors on, on this paper, and there are, but I guess, you know, the thing is that this paper was years in the making, and so authors, um, some authors that were there at the beginning left, so Ekaterina uh, was active in the beginning of the project, she got a job in industry, so she um, didn't work on the project towards the end. And then someone like Valentina Milnik, so she's a uh, professor at UNSW, we brought her in, uh, I think after the first r, &R. So further into the process, she 
is um, she's an expert in loyalty programs. She's done research in loyalty programs. The rest of us have not. So at one point, you know, when we were trying to reconstruct the paper and address the reviewer comments, we thought, hey, we actually need to bring in a loyalty program expert now. And so Valentina came in uh, a little bit later in the project. And something else to note about this uh, research is that myself, Alex, Lubomir and Ekaterina were PhD students of Francois. So something that um, is quite nice about this, this paper is that it actually started off as a class project. So Francois ran a, a meta-analysis course. So he's got um, particular expertise in meta-analysis. He ran a course at UTS. We attended the course and we uh, worked on individual projects. So we chose a topic area where we um, could see that a meta-analysis hadn't been done. And, you know, we didn't do an extensive paper search, but we gathered, you know, 20 papers or so and started working, you know, through the methodology that Francois was teaching us. So at the end of that course, uh, Francois said, you know, hey, guys, I actually think Lubomir's topic of loyalty program, loyalty program effectiveness has the most legs. So if you guys wanted to get together and proceed on that, that would be a good idea if you ask me. So that's what we did. So basically, um, you know, this started as Lubomi, one of our authors, class project. So, yeah, so this project, you know, as a, I guess, a place in my heart because it was, you know, done with my PhD colleagues and friends. And, yeah, so I thought I'd um, share that story. So. So let's get into it. So let's talk about the background. You know, why why did Francois say, you know, he thinks that a meta-analysis and loyalty programs um, has legs? So I'll start with some questions to you. Maybe you can just enter it in, in the chat. So thinking about, you know, your wallet or now you can store the loyalty programs on, on an app on, on your phone. How many loyalty programs would you estimate that you're a member of? Okay, we've got three, too many, about 30. Whoa, okay, 50, zero, Frank, that's odd. <laughs> about nine, five. Okay, so there's quite a bit of variance there with, yeah, 30 probably being the highest. Okay, awesome. So from these, what percent roughly would you say you're actually an active member in? So you actually, um, you know, redeem points or you're, you know, tapping your loyalty card as you're making a purchase. What percent of... Um, those loyalty programs that you are a member of, would you say you're actually active in? Would it be 25%, 50%? What do you think? Okay, so 50, 75, 10, 25. Okay, so quite a bit of variance as well. So less we've got from less less than 10% to I think 75% would be the highest. Okay. Do you feel like you shop more often with the brand since becoming a member? So maybe Maybe pick um, what's the first loyalty program that you're a member of that comes to your mind. So think about that brand. Would you say you shop more often at the brand since becoming a member? So maybe just say yes or no. Okay. So we've got two no's and three yeses. 
six yeses, okay. So again, quite a bit of variance. What about your emotional attachment? Okay, so shopping more often is obviously behavior. What about your emotional attachment? So do you think you are now emotion more emotionally attached to the brand since becoming a loyalty program member? Okay, Joe's quickly said no, not really. Okay, James has admitted that yes just to do with the anxiety of, of missing out. And quite a few not no and not really. Okay. So just keep that in mind um, as we go through uh, the next slide. So one of the reasons that, you know, we, we did the uh, meta-analysis in loyalty programs is that Last year actually marked 40 years since the full full first full-blown loyalty program, which was from uh, American Airlines. So it was the 40-year anniversary of loyalty programs, which made it, you know, a nice time frame to review whether they are effective or not. And the popularity of loyalty programs are, uh, you know, unquestionable. So it'd be hard to think of a brand that doesn't have a loyalty program. So, you know, a stat there from the US, the US consumers hold 3.8 billion memberships. So despite their popularity, there's still a question around whether they are effective or not. So while consumers um, no doubt uh, join loyalty programs, they tend not to be active um, certainly not in all of them, which was, you know, what you mirrored in your answers in the chat. So once that there, um, which you get is from the US, the average consumer belongs to about 14 loyalty programs, but is only active in, you know, less than half of them. So why is that? And you've got some companies that spend a, a real considerable amount in their loyalty programs, right? So, you know, Qantas um, a couple of years ago announced a huge investment in revamping their loyalty program. And then you've got other brands that deliberately avoid them. So Audi, uh, you know, actually have a whole message strategy in their marketing communications, they've got TV commercials that basically say, we're good enough. We don't need a loyalty program. So, you know, we offer everyday value. We've got enough differentiation. We don't need a loyalty program. So, you know, when the, when I guess, you know, what makes a good topic for a meta? One where there's discrepancy in terms of, um, you know, the findings, right? So if there's mass agreement, that's probably not a good area to do a, a meta-analysis in. But here, you know, you've got a topic where um, both scholarly and in industry, there doesn't seem to be an agreement whether they work or not. And given that there's 40 years of research uh, in loyalty programs, you've got quite a big data set to play with. So it's those two factors that made um, this topic quite attractive to explore. So our meta-analysis asks how effective are loyalty programs and what makes them work? So pretty simple question. So this is the meta-analytical framework, okay? And it does look a little bit uh, scary. And, you know, this isn't what we uh, submitted the first time, but with, you know, reviewer uh, comments of, can you look at this? Can you add that? This is how it's ended up. So if we just very, um, if we hone in on, on the middle bit, so, you know, what's involved, okay? So very simply, we're looking at, you know, does loyalty program um, membership, so yes, no, uh, drive, attitudinal loyalty and behavioral loyalty okay so with um, attitudinal loyalty we're talking about a positive attitude a preference for the brand word of mouth with behavioral loyalty we're talking about uh, purchase volume purchase frequency 
expenditure, share of wallet, things like that. And you can see that we've got um, a mediator there as well. So we wanted to see whether, you know, what is the mechanism behind this? So we, um, we have cognitive drivers. So this, of course, um, already exists in the literature, okay? So if you look at the literature and loyalty programs, you know, one suggestion is that there's this info processing mechanism at work. So things like perceived value, um, perceived costs. So there's switching costs, right? So that could be driving um, your loyalty. Uh, there's dependence as well, uh, which I think uh, Jimmy kind of alluded to in, in the chat there. And then we've got um, effective drivers. So this is things like a sense of belonging. So being part of a loyalty program um, can give consumers that, that sense of belonging to something. It can give them a sense of gratitude, a sense of status, okay? But it's not just positive emotions in there. There's also, uh, we also looked at negative emotions. So at times, uh, loyalty program membership can cause uh, skepticism. So, you know, what, why do you need this data? What are you using it for? Uh, frustration if, you know, you're constantly, um, you know, um, trying to earn points, but you don't reach enough to actually get that reward, for example. So frustration is one. Unfairness is, is another. So if you, um, you know, see someone else, you um, you know, getting through um, skipping the queue or, you know, getting some kind of VIP treatment, perhaps, you know, you, you get that sense of unfairness. So there are some negative uh, effect or emotion in there as well. So we wanted to see, you know, what's the underlying mechanism um, driving loyalty program effectiveness. So then you can see um, we've got some moderators that we tested as well. So if we look at what's at the top, um, the top of, um, you know, the main line, you've got LP design characteristics. So this is what's particularly managerially relevant. So how can managers design their loyalty programs to increase effectiveness? So here you've got three different areas. You've got the structure of the loyalty program. So you've got enrollment type. So whether it's open, anyone can join the loyalty program or you have to be invited. Does it make a difference if there's an enrollment fee or not? What about the structure of the loyalty program in terms of tiers? So of course, um, your airlines love this kind of structure where there's tiers, you've got other loyalty programs that are completely flat. Does that make a difference? Uh, Multi-vendor programs, so this is where um, you've got, you know, many brands uh, that come together, so flybys would be an example, versus a single branded loyalty program. So that is what we looked at in terms of LP structure. Then you've got differences in the type of reward. So we wanted to see if that made a difference in terms of loyalty program effectiveness. So here, if you look at the literature, you've got a clear division with uh, hard rewards versus soft rewards. So hard rewards are, are more tangible, right? The, the value's clearer, let's say. So you've got um, whether discounts are offered or not. So $5 off, 10%, whether savings are offered or not. So savings is, um, <coughs> excuse me, a term in the literature that you would probably call it uh, points, right? So is points accumulation part of the, the reward content? But they don't call it uh, points in the literature because at times you're not accumulating points. You could be accumulating dollars or number of visits. So they call it savings. And then you've got uh, the soft rewards. So here you've got whether special attention rewards were offered. So by special attention, we mean a tailored communication or a gift for your birthday. So some kind of reward that makes you feel special. Okay, a lot of the times these um these are unexpected, and 
you've also at times with these soft awards have a, a element of exclusivity okay so if you're giving away a movie ticket um that that's a, a soft um reward but not necessarily exclusive because you know anyone can buy a movie ticket but if you look at uh loyalty programs such as nike plus if you're a nike plus member you're privy to a, an exclusive Nike range, right? That you can only um, access those products if you're a loyalty program member, okay? So that's what we're talking about, exclusivity. Then you've got the way the reward was delivered. So whether direct rewards were offered, so direct rewards means that the rewards actually relate to the category the brand's in. So if we think about kind of Qantas Frequent Flyers and what you can do with your points, you know, you can do an upgrade. Yep, that's a direct reward. You could also, um, you know, get a hotel. That's still hospitality travel. So that's a direct reward. But if you, you know, used your points for a kettle uh, or a bottle of wine, well, that's what's called indirect rewards. So where there's less of a link with the product category. And then lastly, delayed rewards. So delayed rewards, um, you know, we looked at the timing of the rewards. So you join a loyalty program, do you get um, that reward instantly or do you have to um, wait? So delayed versus not. And you can see there, you know, we've got a hypothesis underlying each of these, except for delayed rewards or not. So the literature is really divided as to whether, um, you know, delaying a reward is positive or not positive for uh, loyalty. And then we looked at industry characteristics. So we, you know, thought, you know, you can do this in two ways. You can actually look at whether there's a difference in the typical industries that have loyalty programs. So is there a difference between airlines and retails, retail stores? Or you could do it by characteristics. And this is the way we chose to do it. So we looked at whether the industry is characterized by high or low purchase. Okay. And this way, um, you can you know, adopt that characteristic um, across any kind of industry. You're not, um, you know, if you just looked at retail versus, um, what did I say, retail versus airlines, what if you're a beauty salon or a casino, right? You don't fit in. So every industry is characterised by, by purchase frequency. So the generalizability is greater doing it that way. So now the bottom of the line, I'm not going to go through the ins and outs of this because uh, I will just bore you. But we, like any uh, meta-analysis, you also look at whether methodological factors created a difference um, and publication bias, right? So, you know, of course, you know, in the, well, usually in, in published work, there might be a bias towards having a positive effect. So if you have, um, you know, research where uh, an effect wasn't found, then perhaps it's less likely that it's published. So we look at publication bias. So for a meta-analysis, you actually want published and unpublished work in your data set. And yeah, a whole lot of methodological um, factors that you see there. So some you see in every meta-analysis, such as year is a very typical one. Um, so, you know, does year make a difference to, to the effect? Um, but self-selection, which we've got there as the first one, is very typical to loyalty program research. So this is the idea that if you are already loyal to a brand, you're more likely to join a loyalty program, okay? So if we just, um, if we got some data on Woolworths today and we looked at uh, consumers that are part of Woolworths rewards, so their loyalty program, and those that are not and compare their loyalty, no doubt we'll find that loyalty is greater for those that are part of the loyalty program, but that's not to say that they weren't loyal before, okay? It's very hard to put it down to the loyalty program because the loyalty program 
likely attack, attracted those that were loyal in the first place. So a better way of doing loyalty program research is to track an individual over time. Okay, So if you track an individual sales over time, and then you can see past the point of joining the loyalty program, there's been a jump in their sales or frequency, then um, that reduces the risk of self-selection bias. So whether the original study accounted for self-selection or not is something we controlled for, okay? And that was um, really important to the reviewers as well. So I'm just going to pause and just ask if there's any questions about this uh, meta-analytical framework before I get into the results. You can ask me on chat. Nope. All right, I'll keep going. All right, so before we get into the results, a little bit um, more about the method. So, you know, if you're interested or being curious about doing a meta-analysis and what does that actually involve, this might give you, you know, a little bit of an idea. So the first step is to do that comprehensive search for, for research, for papers, for empirical studies that form part of your data set. So here... You know, we look through the typical academic databases. We look through uh, journals in, um, you know, your typical lists. And then we did a call for unpublished work uh, through the mailing lists of your main academic marketing societies. Our key words um, were, as you can see there on the slide, interestingly, in the beginning uh, for our first submission, we had uh, a narrower selection of keywords. So we, you know, wanted to stay true to the concept of loyalty programs. So something like relationship program, we felt like it could include, um, you know, operalizations of pro of or relationship programs that aren't true to our definition of loyalty programs. So the narrower that you go with your uh, keyword search, the less papers that are going to be retrieved, of course. So what happened after we submitted, um, you know, in the first round, uh, the feedback was that your data set's not big enough, you don't have enough papers, we know that there's more loyalty program research out there, and perhaps your keyword search was too narrow. So then we had to um, extend into terms like uh, relationship program. So the papers we retrieved were 427. And then what you do is that you, um, you know, you come up with a eligibility criteria and you apply it to the papers that you've retrieved. So um, for example, if, you know, we don't, if the paper doesn't um, outline the way that loyalty was measured, so it might say we measured behavioural loyalty, but we can't see the items or what's behind that, we actually excluded it because uh, their definition of behavioural loyalty might be different to ours. So that's one example of why um, we might exclude a paper. But there's many, many um, other reasons. Okay. So I was just checking the chat. Okay, so the final count um, was 110. So, uh, you know, as you can see, quite a drop from uh, 427. And we had... 429 effect sizes. So that's different to um, the paper count because, you know, one paper can have multiple studies with multiple effects. So in terms of our model, there's actually two different models that um, tested that framework you saw on the previous slide. So one is what's known as the meta regression model. So this looks at or tests the effect between loyalty program membership and loyalty, plus all the moderators that you saw. That mediation uh, model uh, was tested via a, a different model. So we had a separate model 
which tested the mechanism. Okay, let's get to the findings. So here in um, what's graphed there, you can see the overall effect of loyalty programs. So what you can see is um, that there is a positive and significant effect. So loyalty programs um, do make consumers more loyal. And the grand mean is 0 0.17, oh, sorry, 0 0.15. So it's not huge, but it is, you know, it does make a positive and small impact on consumer loyalty, which is which is a good story, right? Because that's another thing with meta-analysis. You know, it's it's hard. Um, you, you you try not to offend. So, you know, there's 40 years of research that has got into it. So, you know, what if our research show that in fact um, loyalty programs don't work? Okay, that would be a very hard story to sell. So it was great that we did find a small and uh, positive result. So you can see from the graph there though, there's quite a bit of variance, right? So that's also good for a meta-analysis because variance says, well, um, you know, there's moderators at play here, right? There's context that's actually changing this effect. So let's um, let's look into that. So this table's a little bit um, nasty, but basically, you know, it relates to the findings for um, the hypotheses that you saw in that framework. So all these hypotheses um, should be quite familiar to you because I spent quite a bit of time on that framework. Um, but very briefly, you know, we found that loyalty programs have a stronger effect for behavioural loyalty compared to attitudinal. This is very much in line with what's already there in the literature, right? And also in line with what you told me in the chat. You know, so yes, you know, it um it it tends to increase um you know the amount of times I go to the store or or how much I buy, but that you know that um positive emotion, well that that's kind of you know harder to win over. Uh in terms of so move that. Um we did find a effect when it when it came to um the enrollment structure. So we found that uh, closed enrollments have a stronger effect on loyalty than open enrollments. So if you've been um, invited, perhaps you've got a greater sense of um, gratitude and status. So this is leading to greater loyalty. In terms of fees, um, tiers, and uh, the structure in terms of the number of brands, we didn't find an effect at all. And I think the most controversial one in there is perhaps, you know, the tiers, right? Because like I said, airlines, you know, kind of pride themselves uh, with this kind of structure and we're showing that there's actually no effect from uh, or positive effect from tiered loyalty programs. In terms of the reward content, uh, we found that, Discounts have a weaker effect on um, customer loyalty. So again, very much in line with what's already there in the literature. And savings or points accumulation has a positive effect. Perhaps our most controversial finding of all is that we found that soft rewards, so that, um, <clears throat> you know, the special attention rewards like being receiving some acknowledgement for your birthday actually didn't um, drive positive loyalty at all. In fact, a negative effect was found. So this is a little bit controversial because in the loyalty program literature, you know, it's all about moving away from discounts from your, you know, 5% to making a consumer, you know, feel special, right? And arguably, uh, soft rewards are, are more unique. They're harder to replicate. You know, any brand can do the 5% off. So the fact that we found this significant negative effect um, is a little bit controversial. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, we did find, however, a positive effect for exclusivity. Okay, so, so that's really important and something that is managerially relevant. So, you know, having soft rewards alone isn't enough, but making them exclusive, 
is. Uh, in terms of delivery, um, you know, we found that direct rewards are better than indirect rewards, so a stronger tie to the product category of the brand. Um, that's no surprise. And um, in terms of industry characteristics, we found that lower purchase frequency um, was better for, for loyalty programs. So if you, if you think about uh, what kind of industries have lower purchase frequencies, so you've got uh, airlines, casinos, beauty salons. So you could say that these, because of the lower purchase, it's also characterised by higher risk. And having a loyalty program, the literature already tells us, signals quality. Okay, so there's more trust in a brand that has a loyalty program. So that could explain that relationship with lower purchase frequency. Uh, and in terms of the underlying mechanism, I'll show you this. So we actually tested uh, three alternate models when it came to um, the underlying effect. So whether cognitive and affective drivers um, happened simultaneously, so you can see that in the model to the left, or whether they actually um, happen as, you know, a serial effect, so one after the other. And then with the middle uh, model, we tested cognitive leading to affective, and then with the model on the right, we tested effective leading to cognitive, so we switched it around. So what you can see here is that the model um, with the greatest fit, okay, so the strongest um, goodness of fit index is that model in the middle, okay. So what we found was that um, cognitive drivers, so, you know, perceived value, for example, leads to that positive effect, okay. So you can see the value in the program and that leads to, let's say, gratitude, which leads to loyalty, okay? All right, so in terms of um, some implications, loyalty programs on average do work, which I said, like I said, is a bit of a relief for both scholars and in industry, but more so for behavioural loyalty compared to attitudinal. So um, it's especially valuable for industries uh, characterised by low purchase frequency. What's the ultimate design for a loyalty program? A closed program with um, some kind of points accumulation that allows for a redemption of an exclusive uh, reward and one that's linked to the brand. Um, and ensure that the rational benefits of the loyalty excuse me, of the loyalty program are clear so that consumers are very clear about the value of the loyalty program so that those effective drivers can come into play. In terms of our future research questions, um, you know, a lot of, we, the thing with meta-analysis is that you're only as good as the research that was done before you. So, you know, we would have loved to have looked at um, short-term versus long-term effects, but the data just wasn't there. So how robust are our findings in the long-term? That's a question for future research. Do individual differences matter? That's another um, interesting question. In terms of our findings around special attention, actually reducing loyalty, why is that? So it could be related to privacy concerns. So if you do, you know, get something for, for your birthday, it's just that reminder that they have your data, they know your birthday, right? So is there a concern for privacy that's actually driving that effect? Um, and, you know, how LPs can use digitalization. So this is a big topic in the LP literature. We would have loved to have looked at, you know, whether the loyalty program had an app, for example, but that's just not, um, well, I think we found two or three papers that reported that. So if the original research doesn't report um, on it, the meta-analysis can't look at it. So that is it in terms of um, the research. So I want to spend, um, you know, five minutes talking about my journey in, in landing 
uh, my job at UQ and then I'd love to hear um, some questions from you on either the loyalty program research or, or my experience. So let's do it this way. Okay, so what I um, perceive is that hiring committees have either two philosophies, right? And actually people in the hiring committee can have different philosophies over in terms of research. And it's really a game of quantity versus quality, right? And, and the thing is, as a researcher, it's very hard to do both. You're usually in one camp or the other. So, you know, if you're in the quality camp, you're not going to be as productive research-wise because it takes a long time to produce quality research, okay? Or you're, you know, in the quantity game. So by if you're in the quantity game, it's not that, you know, you're producing crap research. There is still a level of quality that's expected. But, you know, if you're in the quality camp, you're going for your FT50s. If you're in the quantity camp, you're going for A-level journals, still good quality research, but you're emphasising quantity. You're publishing quite consistently, okay? And I think, you know, it's really important to realise which camp you're in. And so once you've, you know, work out whether you're a more of a quantity person or more of a quality researcher, um, that will kind of dictate, you know, which unis you will apply to, okay? But the thing is, you know, just because um, you apply to one particular uni um, being a, a quantity or being a quality researcher and you don't get the role, it doesn't mean you can't apply again because the people in the hiring committee might have changed, okay, and their stance on quality versus quantity um, might now be different. So, you know, if you don't get through once at a particular institution, please do try um, again. So I have applied to UQ for, I don't know, four years. Um, and, yeah, I can definitely at least remember two. I'm sure there's more. So I was applying every year, every time there was an opening, okay? So just because you don't get through once um, doesn't mean you don't get through again because your pipe, your um, yeah, your pipeline, you know, your your research, your your publications, it changes but so do the people in the hiring committee. Um, so if you don't get um, a job right after your PhD ends, like myself, so like I said, my PhD was conferred in 2018 and my you know, full-time job at UQ it was at the beginning of uh, 22. So there's a few years in there. So you've really got to show um, that you've been productive research-wise, okay? So if you don't get land that job straight after your PhD, you know, don't panic, but make sure you are being productive, okay? Both research-wise and um, otherwise. So with the otherwise, you're either being uh, a sessional academic, so you're teaching, or, you know, you, you go into industry like I did. So I know for a fact in my, um, you know, panel, it was revealed to me um, there was a discussion around my productivity because, you know, it's like, oh, this candidate finished in 2018, but she's only got three pubs, right? But then it was like, hang on, she's also been in industry, so her opportunity to publish is less. So just making sure that you are staying productive, okay? It's really important. Have some teaching experience, um, but not too much. So you need to show that you can teach, but having an extensive uh, teaching portfolio, I don't think is helpful. It just takes uh, time away from, from research. Okay, specialize and be known for something. So this is um, something that I'm kind of grappling with at the moment because I keep hearing this, right? And at first it's, it, I thought, really, do I, do I have to specialize? You know, it's in the idea of academia that you research what interests you and that might change. A new topic might interest you and you want to go there. But I really am seeing, you know, the value in this in terms of who has been successful in academia 
and the realization that, yeah, they do tend to specialize. So one thing about specializing is that, yeah, you get to be known for it. That's kind of obvious. But maybe the less obvious one is that you can just be a lot more productive if you specialize. So you become so familiar with the literature uh, that, you know, the whole writing process just becomes a lot quicker. So, you know, I think being special, um, being a specialist does have its benefits. So for me, that's something I'm working on because I always say my specialty is branding. Is that too broad? That's a question that I'm working out at the moment. Um, network, network, network. Don't say no to any um, opportunity, especially uh, at the beginning of your career. So, you know, you just don't know where it's going to going to lead you. So, you know, when we invite um, speakers to UQ and I send an email, you know, asking the, the HDR students um, if they want one-to-one -one -one visits, you know, if they say no, their reason is, well, oh, that academics research doesn't align with mine, which in my opinion, you should just be networking with everyone because, yeah, maybe their research doesn't align with you, but they're likely to know someone whose research does align with yours and they can put you in contact. So networking is really important uh, in this game. So I really do encourage you to, to network. Um, collaborate with those that you can learn something from. Okay, so if you are a PhD student, my advice would be towards the end, start working on other projects. So like I did with the loyalty program um, project. So that wasn't part of my, my PhD. And, you know, collaborate with those that, you know, that you perceive are a little bit above you in terms of um, the topic, either they have more expertise in, in your um, area or, um, you know, you perceive them to be superior method-wise. So you can learn from them, but not so senior, right, that they just don't have time for you. So by, you know, having some collaborators that fit in that, it's really going to lift you up. Um, but yeah, aiming for the stars and having that big name can work as well. But in my opinion, yeah, you just risk the fact that, you know, they've got no time for you to develop you. Um, yeah, and, you know, for me, uh, to be very honest, you know, this Jams publication did open uh, a lot of doors. I, like I said, I applied to UQ year after year. I also applied to two different institutions uh, in Queensland and made it to the interview stage and then, uh, you know, didn't get the role. So, so to me, I think it was having that, that one quality publication uh, that, that did make a difference. So that's my journey. That's not to say, you know, you absolutely need an FT50 uh, to, to, to get a, a job, but Personally, I think that's uh, what opened the door for me. All right, I'm dying to get um, some questions. <laughs> so over to you.